All right. So today's lecture is uh, going to, I called it dopamine psychosis. Um, we're at a, a point in the didactic cycle where um, last week we talked about what I call pharmacotypes of schizophrenia. Uh, for the next several weeks, we're going to focus on each, uh, on different um, biological types or theories of schizophrenia etiology. Uh, so we're going to start off this series of lectures talking about the neurotransmitter system, which was the first to be linked to schizophrenia and for which we probably have the most data and certainly represents the dominant hypothesis in schizophrenia theory, uh, that being the dopamine hypothesis. Um, so we're going to then take a look at the evidence for uh, that supports it and some of the implications of those data. Uh, so going chronologically, we got to a dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia simply because we had the good fortune historically of discovering some medicines that seemed to be quite helpful for many people that experienced psychotic illness. Uh, so following the drugs, uh, pharmacologists were able to figure out that the common element in the various drugs that showed efficacy was an ability to block the dopamine receptor, um, and specifically uh, the dopamine D2 subtype of receptor. Um, once that piece of knowledge was figured out, then um, we were off to the races um, as, as a as a profession and as an industry uh, because the name of the game became uh, synthesized drugs that block dopamine. And in the course of drug evolution, we found this, an interesting graph like this that shows that the affinity of the drug at the D2 receptor represented here on the y-axis um, tightly correlates with the amount of that drug that's required to relieve psychosis. Um, this figure or similar figures appear in uh, the classic textbooks of psychiatry. Um, so on the, the x-axis toward the left, it represents lower and lower doses. Um, and on the y-axis going down represents higher and higher drug affinities. So the drugs like um, Brexpiprazole um, or Flufenazine or Haloperidol that um, can bind to the D2 receptor at sub nanomolar concentrations require essentially single digit dosing to be effective. Whereas uh, drugs that have uh, say double or triple digit effic uh, affinity at the D2 receptor um, like clopromazine or, uh, or ketiapine or clozapine require uh, many hundreds of milligrams per day to be effective. So the tightness of this relationship, I mean the fact that D2 receptor blockers were reliably effective at reducing schizophrenia associated psychosis and observations that there is this incredibly tight relationship between affinity of the D2 receptor and the amount required to alleviate psychosis um, is pillar number one of the dopamine hypothesis. Uh, pillar number two, um, the converse, drugs that block um, dopamine can alleviate psychosis. Um, and conversely, drugs that augment the signal of dopamine can fairly reliably cause psychosis. Um, so pro-dopamine drugs, um, a, a few of them are listed here. All of these drugs have an ability to elicit psychosis as a side effect. Um, L-dopa is a precursor for dopamine. Uh, it's used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and uh, high, at high enough doses of L-dopa, um, psychosis results. Also in the Parkinson's disease agents, you have, um, you have some specific D2 agonists, some, some synthetic ones like Pramipexol and Ropinerol, um, going into the brand names of Mirapex and um, I'm blanking on the Requip, thank you, uh, for the synthetic ones and then the good old fashioned bromocryptine. Um, all of them are used primarily in Parkinson's disease treatment. They have other uses, but for another time. Um, and these drugs can very reliably induce uh, psychosis, as well as, interestingly, um, impulsive behaviors. Uh, so when, uh, when, when Repramipexol was new on the market, um, we started to see reports of um, elderly individuals who, for the first time in their lives, took up an extreme interest in gambling or solicitation of prostitutes. Um, so we have a you know, we learned some stuff about dopamine system by looking at the side effects of drugs. Um, so 
bottom line, drugs that cause dopamine to be released or dopamine receptors activated can, can reliably cause uh, schizophrenia, cause a psychosis that looks identical clinically to what you see in people with schizophrenia. Uh, for review, um, these are some principal dopamine pathways in the brain. Um, they, dopamine is one of the neurotransmitters that follows the rule. A handful of neurons and specific nuclei within the brain synthesize the neurotransmitter, and those small populations of neurons will project transmitter to uh, terminals at fairly large target regions in the brain. Uh, so the stri we're, we're seeing here uh, the nigrostriatal pathway. Um, overactivity here is thought to uh, be related to motoric symptoms. Um, the ventral, to the, to the mesolimbic pathway from um, dopamine producing cells in the midbrain extending to limbic, limbic areas and frontal cortex, um, and the tubero infundibular pathway. So these, these, these two pathways relate to um, symptoms or drug side effects that, that affect motor, motor, motor systems, um, prolactin release, or um, it's theorized uh, motivation and perception. So uh, this is going to be, for those who attended last week, this is going to be slightly a review, but I just want to talk again about um, connecting the dots between how overactivity in dopamine signaling can elicit symptoms uh, that we recognize as belonging to schizophrenia. Um, I also want to point out here that um, a, a, a whole bunch of modern data are pointing to the specific defect or the specific abnormality in dopamine signaling as being localized to the presynaptic side. And more specifically, it appears that uh, people that are schizophrenia or psychosis prone um, have an ability to make larger than expected amounts of dopamine in the nerve terminals. Um, and to release larger than expected amounts of dopamine from nerve terminals. So it's very much uh, the, 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 the abnormality is before the synapse. Um, and when dopamine is released, uh, in, in, particularly in the striatum, so invoking the nigrostriatal pathway here, um, that dopamine action in the striatum um, tends to shift the brain from what's called default mode network processing to central executive network processing. In other words, the brain moves from sort of a rest and rumination and introspection into a observation and problem solving and integration of information mode. Um, that, um, when, when that happens, uh, neuropsychologists call this um, a cue for salience. And when dopamine is released and it turns the brain on to start doing problem solving, the conscious mind or the conscious cognition part of our mind uh, begins to wonder what, you know, something happened here that I need to figure out the significance of, what could be the significance of whatever caused the stimulus. And if you experience um, that kind of signal, like, hey, there's something to pay attention to, when uh, the stimulus is something that is uh, ordinarily innocuous, say like eyeglasses or notebook, um, then you begin to uh, weave a tale of uh, perhaps this is an enchanted notebook, or perhaps this is a contaminated set of glasses. Um, some, you know, the, the, the brain will go for ideas that try to fit the emotional cue it got from the stimulus. And over time, um, you can change how you think about the world. Uh, if, if notebooks are consistently giving me this signal of salience, I'm going to start having special regard um, and may come up with explanations about notebooks that would be um, uh, sinister or supernatural. Um, and so that's the, that's the theory. Um, so given that information, um, a little bit of fine tuning of the dopamine signal can be a fabulously good thing. Uh, when we block excessive dopamine signaling, we can then turn off the, the uh, consistent um, aberrant salient signals and have a chance for um, older style cognitions or, co or psychotherapy assisted cognition uh, strategies to be engaged. And so that's, uh, you know, that's a theory of how, how drugs work. Um, we also are beginning to get a good idea of um, about exactly how much dopamine fine tuning is required to make things good as opposed to make things bad. Uh, we can do this using PET imaging, uh, positron emission tomography. Uh, in doing this, you will inject somebody with a drug that emits positrons and also binds to dopamine receptors. So um, spiperone could be an example of, of such, a, such a chemical. Um, you put a um, positron emitting atom on spiperone and inject it. And then you give people 
risperidone, haloperidol, uh, whatever else, and then you'll kick off the radio-labeled drug from the receptors. And in the PET's camera, you can visualize the, the kicking off of these of these um, of, of the label that you had pre-injected. And in doing this, you know about what percentage of the receptors are being um, blocked uh, by the by the drug of choice. And using such uh, techniques, we, we've learned that you start to see antipsychotic efficacy with as little as 40% blockade of dopamine receptors. Um, that translates into a uh, Haldol equivalent dose of between one and two milligrams. So um, I, for those of you who have been doing this for a while, particularly if you, see, if you cut your teeth in hospital settings, um, you'll recognize one to two milligrams of haloperidol as a surprisingly low number, but that's where the data actually points us. Um, the, and to be clear, that's the starting level for antipsychotic efficacy. Um, the, the majority of studies will suggest that um, you need to occupy 60 to 70% of D2 receptors to get antipsychotic efficacy. Um, and the studies are kind of overwhelming in um, consistency of finding that when you get to more than 75% dopamine receptor blockade, you begin to see extrapyramidal side effects like dystonia or drug-induced Parkinsonism. Um, so when you begin to see these EPS, this is like the body's way of telling you that you've exceeded the 78% or 75% um, D2 occupancy threshold. Um, and we, we don't want to go that we don't want to go as high as we can because dopamine is a reward molecule. And when you block that signal, you also then create um, side effects like anhedonia or a motivation or apathy. Um, and in fact, these side effects of excessive dopamine blockade um, get the name secondary negative symptoms. So uh, a portion of what gets called negative symptoms in schizophrenia care may actually be a secondary negative symptom, uh, one of the causes of secondary symptoms being excessively dosed D2 blockers. Um, and so now some pictures to try to um, uh, Further the point that uh, more is not better. Um, you've heard me say before, I'm a pharmacologist, and this means that I, I love drugs. And one of the things I love about drugs is that they tell the truth. Um, and uh, in this particular facet of pharmacology, this is as constant as the law of gravity. It's called the law of mass action. Um, every drug that binds to a receptor, which is to say every drug except for alcohol or the, or the anesthetics, um, follows this relationship between concentration on the x-axis and occupancy of the target protein on the y-axis. Um, you'll notice on the left, when we look at non-law of transformed data, uh, that that curve reaches a flat part, an asymptote. Um, this curve, mathematicians tell me, is uh, called hyperbolic. I still struggle to see why they call it hyperbolic, but I didn't go into math. Um, so, the, but the point here is, is that um, once you get to that asymptote, you can increase the drug as much as you want, and you're not going to further really have any significant move on the occupancy of your target proteins. So if you believe that blocking dopamine receptors is important, then when you, ex when you get to the asymptotic part of the curve, um, you'll get no further, um, no further benefit if you believe that the benefit is due to dopamine receptor blocking. Let me show you some pictures to try to tell you um, that, you know, what, what would be reasonable doses or at least where, where we start to see the, the, the bend to the asymptote. So this is a uh, graph where they've looked at dopamine receptor occupancy on y-axis um, and on the x-axis they've normalized the drug concentration into oral risperidone dose. Um, and you see that you're, be, you're beginning to bend to the asymptote by about three milligrams. So uh, that's, that's in line with other data that says that probably for a chronically ill person, uh, the ideal dose of risperidone would be around the four milligram range. Um, and there you go, for, for the drug naive person, risperidone can be effective at doses you know, closer, to, closer to the ED50, or in other words, around the one milligram to two milligram range. Um, Zaprazidone, here's a, here's a curve uh, where they've showed the same thing. We're looking now both at the, um, the, the serotonin to, to a uh, blocking, 
as well as a D2 blocking. And you'll see both of them follow an asymptote and um, they, they conclude that beyond 120 milligrams per day, you don't really get further moving on that, on that line. Uh, this is a drug, a, a dose uh, a concentration occupancy relationship for, for risperidone and paliperidone. We've now um, completed the curve, so we see that both of them reach the same asymptote. And this is a curve, oh, this is the same, sorry. Uh, this is a curve for aripiprazole. Uh, looking at D2 receptor occupancy. Notice that you've reached the asymptote between 10 and 30 milligrams. So um, the, the standard approved doses in prescribing information are 15 and 30. Um, the drug manufacturer knows very well what these curves look like when they introduce the drugs into clinical trials. So, um, so there you go. So 45 milligrams of result, certainly not more occupancy than 30. And actually 30 is debatably um, not significant versus 10 in terms of dopamine D2 receptor occupancy. Notably as well, if you want to target 50% occupancy of D2 receptor, or maybe 60%, you would be looking at oral doses in the range of between one and two milligrams, which by the way, turns out to be doses that are frequently helpful for individuals with a first episode of schizophrenia psychosis. Um, so we've looked at, so there, uh, the dopamine hypothesis is actually pretty simple. <laughs> dopamine is related to psychosis and blocks of do drugs that block dopamine can be helpful for alleviating psychosis. Um, and it's certainly the oldest hypothesis that we have. Um, still with this, it remains, although the hypothesis very well can explain suspiciousness, paranoia, um, unusual ideas through the process of apparent salience and the cognitions around it, um, it still seems to be a little bit torturous for the hypothesis to very well explain how hallucinations work. Um, it's even more challenging uh, in this model to explain how primary negative symptoms are, are uh, present. And uh, this hypothesis is actually unhelpful in explaining uh, the mechanism of illness for the 30% or more of people with schizophrenia for whom dopamine receptor blockers are clearly not working. So um, we'll talk about what other processes might be going on in that 30%, and also in future lectures, we'll talk about the um, mechanisms of hallucination and um, negative symptoms as well. So those are the end of my, um, oh, sorry, I thought there was, that was the end. This is, so this is, this is, this is the, the real end. Um, dopamine overactivity can explain many, but not all features of schizophrenia. Um, looking at dose occupancy curves, um, one concludes that many people with schizophrenia are probably exposed to medication doses which are unnecessarily high. Um, this is not a lecture about how to reduce dose. Um, I would caution anybody who's been inspired by my words um, to consider dose reduction, to do it very carefully. Um, certainly, you know, contact us uh, if you would like some to talk about that because the, the risk of abrupt discontinuation on somebody who's been on a dose for a long time is uh, rebound psychosis. So you'll want to think about a strategy for um, dose reduction or deprescribing. And, uh, and to summarize, dopamine hypothesis is incomplete in that it, it really doesn't help us to understand the phenomenon of so-called treatment resistance. That's the end of the program.